Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Modeling the Metropolis, the Architectural Model in Victorian London by Matthew Wells, published by Getty Verlag. Architectural models made 19th century London. As the city grew, it became the global center of finance, industrial capitalism and the British Empire. New buildings, urban spaces and networks of infrastructure were demanded, constructed and rebuilt. Models were a crucial medium of communication that enabled architects, politicians and the wider public to conceive the city's expansion of buildings and spaces. Based on extensive research in archives, museums and period publications, Modeling the Metropolis addresses not just architectural models, but also an eclectic range of images and objects, from technical products to sculptures, diagrams to engravings, maps to photographs, that dramatize the politics and aesthetics of Victorian London. In his 1888 essay on London, the American author Henry James attributed the difficulty of understanding the dreadful, delightful city to its immeasurability. On his journey down from Liverpool by train, he encountered the endless terraced houses and miles of viaducts, the webs of roads and mazes of railway signals, all of which left him with the impression of an immense metropolis. Each morning, James would set off from his drab hotel in Trafalgar Square to explore a different area, often walking across the city in the rain. From the banks of the Thames, he saw London as the largest chapter of human accidents, a strangely mingled monster made evident in the construction of its houses, without ornament, without grace, without character or identity, the location and expense of its parks, and, above all, its spectacular absence of urban planning. While he recognized parts of the city from lithographs, novels, magazines, songs and maps, the immensity of London as a whole was impossible to fathom, so much so that James resorted to metaphor to describe his experiences of its buildings and streets. She has no time for fine discriminations, but after all, she is as good-natured as she is huge, and the more you stand up to her, as the phrase is, the better she takes the joke of it. As he walked through the murky modern Babylon, from Chelsea and Notting Hill in the west to Wapping and Blackwell in the east, the city itself was changing. During the 19th century, London grew in population and became the global city of finance, industry, technology and the capital of the British Empire. New buildings, new urban spaces and new networks of infrastructure were required and constructed. Or, as John Summerson put it, London was more excavated, more cut about, more rebuilt and more extended than at any time in its previous history. Contemporary writers turned to metaphor to describe the horrors and wonders of London, Babylon, the labyrinth, the great then. Architects looked to a specific visual media. Modeling the metropolis examines how architectural models made these changes conceivable as London's past and present were rewritten by the forces of modernity. During this reconfiguration, architectural models came to play a central role in the interactions between architects, politicians and the wider public across local, national and transregional settings. To take a line from Caroline R. Scott and Griselda Pollack on Victorian art, the debate was not about a place, but about a process. Whether employed as educational or explanatory devices in the construction of new civic buildings, used in private debates or included in public exhibitions, architectural models enabled audiences to visualize different realities, thereby enabling discussions about the past, the present and the future appearance of the contemporary city. Within these settings, the three enfranchising reform acts of the 19th century, 1832, 1867, 1888, provided a new context and series of concerns for the built environment, both of which made London the subject of popular and professional debate. 
These debates often turned on the ability of a model to present an accurate idea of a completed building to the public prior to its construction, with commentators questioning the appropriateness of particular scales, viewing positions or model-making materials. Equally, models became a part of how new institutions, such as the South Kensington Museum or the Museum of London, delivered public education to their visitors. Equally, by the late 1880s, education in the capital's university had been formalized, and for students of architecture or engineering, particular value was placed on models as specimens for the study of ornament, technology and historic buildings. Meanwhile, certain models were used symbolically in civic occasions, such as groundbreaking ceremonies or public openings. Likewise, the mid-century expansion of new building codes and legislation in London facilitated a significant increase in building litigation, and a new type of model surfaced in the courtroom, used as a rhetorical tool by architects and lawyers. Beyond these parliamentary and forensic capacities, in their representations of historic landscapes, proposed buildings and new methods of construction, models became a popular way for audiences to interact with the built environment at the major expositions of the 19th century. At the Great Exhibition of 1851, architectural models were exhibited within fine arts, a subcategory that also contained topographic and anatomic examples. Little attention has been paid to these installations, with architectural historians instead focusing on more explicitly architectural examples, significantly those related to the German emigre Gottfried Semper's exhibition design and subsequent theoretical synthesis. And yet, among the first objects seen by visitors at the west entrance to the exhibition hall was a model presented by the Liverpool Architectural Association, which depicted a vast 300-acre portion of the city that included the many dockyards along the River Mercy, each of the city's three railway stations and significant urban monuments including the Town Hall, the Custom House and Charles Robert Crockerell's magnificent Greek revival St. George's Hall. Costing £750, about £60,000 in today's money, each building was modeled with great accuracy and care, and the whole ensemble was spectacularly presented in a glass case supported by columns sprouting from 16 stone elephants. The previous summer, local architects and their assistants had surveyed Liverpool making a set of elevation drawings that were then transferred onto wooden blocks representing each of the city's buildings. When viewed from London's High Park, these scenes transported visitors to an entirely different city. In turn, Liverpool was not simply viewed by the thousands of exposition visitors. It was in fact Liverpool as modeled that enabled the city to be understood on a national and international stage. Modeled railway connections and industrial buildings presented Liverpool as part of the British nation, while through the representation of the endless landscape of docks, the city was shown to be part of the matrix of global affairs and central to the British colonial project. The aim of this book is to combine the study of objects, architectural models, with a new historical reading of architectural practice, one that takes into account the emergence of professionalism in the construction of Victorian London. Whether discussed in print or experienced first-hand, architectural models enable social and politico-economic interactions to happen in society. This book uses these interactions and their debate, discussion or presentation to question the more traditional understanding of architecture as a discipline defined primarily in terms of authorship. Instead, it offers a new perspective with a cast of characters, architects, model makers, the models themselves. 
all of these people, processes, functions and objects present a rich and multifarious picture of a modern metropolis, shaped by many hands, one that changes the conventional notion of design as the sole activity of the profession. The most striking contribution of architectural models to existing understanding is the wide range of situations in which they were deployed, examined and discussed while the authority of the profession was being established during the 19th century. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.